Well, good morning to you. Uh, I'm Lee Hamilton. I'm the president of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Director's Forum with the Director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, Dr. Michael R. Anastasio. Established by an act of Congress in 1968, the Wilson Center is our nation's official living memorial to President Wilson. It was founded to honor and build upon his legacy as a man who bridged the divide between scholarship and public policy. We try to bring together the thinkers and the doers, the policy makers, scholars, business leaders, in the hope and in the belief that a frank and open dialogue will lead to better understanding and to better public policy. There is perhaps no more consequential example of the bridging of the worlds of policy and scholarship in American history than what began at Los Alamos in 1943 under the stewardship of J. Robert Oppenheimer and Leslie Groves. The Manhattan Project and the weapons it produced went on to change the world forever. Los Alamos has continued to play a vital role in America and the world's scientific development in the last uh, over six decades. It remains a testimony to American ingenuity, innovation, and scientific excellence. We at the center have worked closely with Los Alamos on a host of issues under the direction of uh, Dr. Robert Litwack, ranging from supercomputers to the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and non-proliferation. That partnership has been underway for nearly a decade. We highly value our important institutional partnership with Los Alamos. In the 21st century, the scientific environment is changing faster than ever, as has the relationship between science and government forged in the middle of the 20th century. In this dramatically different security environment, who can doubt that the national laboratories will continue to have a critical role to play. To discuss the changing role of science and our national laboratories in meeting challenges of this new era, there is no better qualified speaker than Michael Anastasio. He served as, he has served as the director of the National Laboratory at Los Alamos since 2006. Prior to that, he was the director of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, tasked with countering the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and strengthening homeland security against the terrorist use of such weapons. He is a recipient of the 1990 Department of Energy Weapons Recognition of Excellence Award for technical leadership in nuclear design, stemming from his researching into design, evaluation, and understanding of nuclear systems. In the Wilsonian tradition, he also has a distinguished record in academia. He taught at Brooklyn College of the City University of New York. He serves on a variety of committees ranging from the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Science and Technology for Countering Terrorism to the Blue Ribbon Task Force on Nanotechnology. He has a BA in Physics, received his Master's and Doctorate in theoretical physics from the State University of New York, Stony Brook. Dr. Anastasio, we welcome you to the center. Look forward to your comments after his more formal remarks. Uh, we'll have a few opportunities for questions. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Lee, for that kind introduction uh, and also for the good collaboration that uh, our two institutions have with each other. Uh, the Cold War has ended, but the national security challenges confronting the United States and the world uh, remain daunting. These challenges are even more complex and difficult to address uh, in this day and age due to the emerging security issues uh, as well as the legacy issues of the Cold War. A sustained, long-term commitment to science and technology is essential in addressing these challenges and the lab, national laboratories can play an important role. 
Yet today's focus is being driven more and more to the near term with more discrete uh, and narrowly defined deliverables. And I think the me basic message of my talk today is that I think it's time for a rebuilding of the partnership that uh, Lee uh, talked about in the beginning, a partnership between government and the science and technology community, uh, a partnership that can be effective in meeting today's challenges uh, as well as tomorrow's in the environment we're in. So let me uh, talk a little more about, uh, about that. The, the major threats to national and international security today stem from the confrontation, not from the con confrontation between great powers, but from terrorism, proliferation, and a range of regional issues. The dimensions of security also include uncertainty over energy resources, the consequences of climate change, cybersecurity, new pathogens, and other threats to human health. While the United States does not regard the Russia or the China today uh, as an enemy, their long-term evolution is also a concern, and we must guard against the emergence of a peer adversary. Terrorism, including state-sponsored terrorism, dominates the U.S. national security agenda today. And in the complex geopolitics of the emerging security environment, for example, issues of a rogue regime behavior, terrorist tactics, weapons of mass destruction proliferation, and deterrence all intersect with uh, nuclear energy, energy security, and global warming. That nexus is very complicated, uh, and, we'll, uh, and a holistic approach to it uh, will demand the best in science and technology, uh, of course, as well as uh, many other things. So are we in a position today to provide that needed science and technology? And will we be able to do that in the future? Can we create a vision for de developing, using, and sustaining needed science and technology capabilities that, that matches those that gave us leadership and direction in the middle of the 20th century? I believe we can, and uh, my remarks today are directed at uh, my thoughts in this regard. If we look back uh, to the Cold War, I think there's some lessons that apply for us today. Uh, there, the role of science and the U.S. national laboratories in particular in pro promoting U.S. national security uh, has changed dramatically over the last uh, six decades since uh, Los Alamos was first founded. We have moved from significant government investment in and leadership of big science uh, as the Cold War developed to diminishing federal industrial vet investment in the post-Cold War period. Although the challenges we face today as well as in the future are different from those of the Cold War. The lessons of the past, I think, are very important to us. The government investment in science in the 40s and 50s had its origin during the war. Uh, again, as uh, uh, Mr. Hamilton said, in such large-scale efforts as the Manhattan Project. There were great expectations for the potential dividends of science and technology investments leading to significant support for programs and technologies designed to ensure uh, post-World War II national security and prosperity. As Vannevar Bush's report to the president on science, the endless frontier put it, and I quote, science by itself provides no panacea to individual, social, and economic ills. It can be effective in national welfare only as member of a team, whether the conditions be peace or war. But without scientific progress, no amount of achievement in other directions can assure our health, prosperity, and security as a nation in the modern world. I think those thoughts still apply to today. In the manner in which Vannevar Bush's vision was realized during the Cold War, I think are illustrative, a comprehensive struggle, uh, the Cold War being a comprehensive struggle on a global scale against a determined adversary uh, with uh, important and significant military and uh, political resources. A science and technology investment was seen as in a cost-effective way uh, to achieve strategic goals. That view of science inspired a generations of Americans' youth, uh, me included. Uh, I still remember uh, the day uh, sitting uh, in elementary school at the time when Sputnik went up and uh, the great uh, interest that caused and that kind of um, 
the energy behind that and the action of the country and the government uh, in that regard helped push my career uh, forward uh, all the way through graduate school, by the way, uh, and, and I ended up here. Um, and because, in, fa in fact, that it not only inspired the youth, but there uh, were significant science education uh, programs that were prom promoted uh, as an element of national security need um, in, in order to win the, the so-called long war. Government investments in science were made through the military, the Atomic Energy Commission and the new national laboratories that went with it, and the new government agencies such as the National Science Foundation. Even these reasonably favorable circumstances uh, required presidential leadership uh, for success. Confronted with the need for nuclear deterrence and the promise of nuclear energy, uh, President Eisenhower in his uh, historic 1953 speech uh, at the UN announced an Adams for Peace proposal. The president sought to expedite the development of the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and by offering uh, the benefits of of such to those states that renounced the nuclear weapons, he also sought to promote non-proliferation. Non Los Alamos heeded the call of the president, the call to arms, and was at the forefront of nuclear energy and non-proliferation development uh, all the way back in the 50s, of course, as well as the effort to ensure the United States had a safe and reliable nuclear deterrent. The successes of the Cold War from deterrence to space technology with satellites and space-based sensors and communications, uh, or to nuclear, uh, to energy technology and health sciences, all follow that same path of reliance on science and the decisiveness of our leaders. Today's expectations for science and technology, uh, I feel, are more limited, and the climate for investment less promising. Even though the more diffuse threats to our security and prosperity are in many ways more complex and difficult than those during the Cold War. The focus of government is more and more on near-term solutions, a seemingly without the clear understanding that sustained investment in discovery science can be translated into future solutions uh, uh, for the future challenges we face. And the government is relying more on the marketplace for these near-term actions, uh, the marketplace which itself has backed away from long-term investments in science. Science and technology investment continues to pay important dividends in a variety of areas like biotechnology or nanotechnology. Uh, and there are signs of growing expectations for further science and technology payoff in such energy areas as energy, the environment, and information sciences. But the long-term strategic R&D investments by government and industry have declined. Cutting-edge technology, of course, is no longer the preserve of just a few advanced countries with the finest institutions. The more diverse origins and widespread diffusion of new knowledge uh, constitute a double-edged sword, uh, and all the way back to uh, Eisenhower's speech where we, he talked about uh, nuclear weapons and, and, and the benefits of nuclear energy. Uh, I think an important example for today is uh, information science and technology and <laughs> cybersecurity. Uh, we are so uh, more and more dependent on our information and technology at the same time, uh, that same technology can be turned, uh, as a, uh, turned on us as a threat. Not only great powers, but all states and even non-state actors have ready access to the fruits of science and technology investment by open societies. This access has contributed to the changing character of threats to national and international security, uh, an example being the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and asymmetric warfare. The rapid pace of science and technology advances can enable more rapid and broader based responses to prevent technological, operational, and tactical surprise. However, at the same time, that generates a very tight turning radius for responses uh, that I believe require new, agile, and more sustainable mechanisms for investment in science and technology. Uh, after all, we, uh, with this kind of open uh, exchange and availability of science and technology, it's important to be first to market uh, as we go forward in the struggles ahead. At the same time, there's significant concern attracting top students into the physical sciences, mathematics, and engineering, uh, per the Rising Above the Gathering Storm uh, study by the National Academy of Sciences uh, 
just a few years ago. And I won't speak to the details of that more, but to say uh, there is a lot of concern that we're attracting the best students uh, into these fields and, and to continue the, uh, having them continue their, uh, their careers uh, uh, in support of these issues. So this is our new reality, and it demands a vision no less bold than those espoused 60 years ago by the architects of the post-World War II world. So as I look to the future, science and technology will continue to be a vital tool for the country's national security. And I believe that uh, national labs will be critical to any viable solutions. Academic and other pure research institutions focus on discovery, discovery of new knowledge. Other sectors, such as industry, concentrate on delivery of specific applications in the form of products. Uh, these national laboratories, uh, like Los Alamos, address large-scale national challenges in areas typically not covered by industry or academic science and technology. These areas are often cross-cutting uh, and, and may have no direct market other than the government itself. Drawing both on both their breadth and depth in science, technology, and engineering, the laboratories can quickly form multidisciplinary teams to provide system-level solutions. The laboratories have also have the flexibility or have had the flexibility to respond quickly to immediate urgent needs using cutting-edge instruments and tools, many of which were developed at the labs themselves. In addition to the science of scale, the national laboratories translate new knowledge into demonstrations of feasibility. As bridges spanning the gulf between discovery and application, laboratories like Los Alamos are firmly anchored on both sides. As active participants in basic research, uh, we at Los Alamos have developed key initial insights into chaos theory, contributed fun fundamental discoveries into the mass of the neutrino, pioneer discoveries of the genetic characteristics of the HIV virus, produced self-replicating materials, pioneered metal foams, and explored physics at temperatures uh, at absolute zero. At the same time, we have also developed finished systems in areas that remain federal responsibilities. Of course, the obvious example is our uh, design and development of nuclear weapons and some of the uh, subsystems and systems that go with it. Less well known is that Los Alamos the designs, for example, uh, designs and produces finished space satellites and satellite components for launch by NASA. Uh, and I think if I were to expand and pause on this for a little bit, a uh, little, uh, a moment, I think this illustrates a very important point of the dual use. Uh, at the laboratories, uh, or at Los Alamos is an example here, uh, there was a real concern of how do you monitor uh, treaties uh, banning nuclear explosions. And the laboratory developed the technology to allow us, let's say, to go into space with the tech detection systems uh, to watch for that. Um, very interesting, challenging. At the same time, of course, those same detectors could be used for other things uh, if you're there already. Uh, and this leads to the application uh, to, a, to an agency like NASA where we can study uh, how lightning works or we can discover new uh, phenomena uh, in the universe, all that was happened. And by doing that, you have advanced, used the technology, advanced the technology for those applications, which then feed back into uh, your ability to carry out your original mission. So the same basic technology is there developed uh, and applied for your, uh, your basic mission it uh, allows you to reach out and affect and cause other things to happen, make other advancements, which spins back into your core mission. There are many examples of this uh, throughout the laboratories. And uh, other examples of uh, system level uh, applications that we've done uh, include the advances in large scale computing, uh, climate and ocean modeling, uh, quantum computing, mechanisms for triggering earthquakes, quantum dots and solid state lighting, and advanced reactor and fuel cycle R&D. As this uh, short list of accomplishments demonstrates, 
national labs like Los Alamos, and of course the other labs have similar kinds of accomplishments, uh, are well positioned to contribute discovery to application solutions to address national security needs. Notably, again, in areas not covered by industry and academic science and technology. As we look to pursue advances in knowledge, we can see issues spiral in and out of concern to those responsible for national security. And in some ways, the scientists at the labs are stewards that keep the basic science and technology vital uh, through mechanisms like I uh, talked to with a satellite and explosion monitoring and keep it available for times of national need, trying to anticipate the future and all the opportunities and challenges it holds. I think another illustrative example uh, is counterterrorism and the technology that will go with, uh, with it, that it turns out we were able at the labs to field on September 12, 2001, uh, when the terrorism occurred uh, at, uh, in New York and in, here in Washington. Uh, the labs uh, in the early 90s had anticipated that one of the impending threats to the country would be around terrorism, and we had the uh, discretion to, to cobble together uh, some effort to start looking at what we could do uh, with science and technology to counter that sort of threat. Uh, and in, by, by providing an integration uh, across our science and technology and across uh, our experience in many different areas, we were able to come up with a number of interesting uh, things that we brought to uh, fruition in a feasibility sense. Even though we didn't have a clear federal sponsor uh, for this work. And then when 9-11 uh, uh, happened, uh, we were able to bring at least those demos, feasibility, uh, technologies into the field right away, and a number of them really, uh, in fact, were deployed. Another story along the same line, which I think illustrates uh, uh, this spiral that's so important, uh, for, uh, important to understand about the laboratories. Back in the 50s, uh, we started working on the health, uh, health physics aspects of radiation. Nuclear weapons, of course, uh, a lot of concern about the effects of radiation. Started working on that, developed some uh, good biological understanding of what that meant. Uh, and then when you started thinking about that, and DNA was discovered, and understanding the fundamentals uh, of how a cell works, we're able to bring together uh, our computing and our engineering skills, and realized in the 80s uh, that the, despite the general view in the biological community, that in fact we could, in a finite amount of time, sequence the human genome. And DOE, the Department of Energy, was foresightful enough to uh, support that, and that was the beginning of what uh, became sequencing the, the sequence of the human genome, which of course was taken over by private industry as it should be. Uh, but the labs, uh, uh, led, led by Sig, Sig Hecker, one of my predecessors, uh, really inspired uh, and showed the way that this could actually get done. Uh, having done that, uh, you can take that understanding of uh, genomics and apply it to, uh, to buy things like uh, pathogens, uh, anthrax, or such things as that. And we were able to do that, working for some sponsors, and with that uh, understanding, you can then go, can I build a detector that allow you to, to note the presence of such a pathogen? And that detector was, again, uh, sponsored by the Department of Energy, uh, allowed us to start to field that in some demonstration examples. And then when the anthrax, anthrax letter got to delivered to Congress, uh, we were able, uh, working with other labs and DOE, to bring that uh, technology to the field and be deployed uh, very shortly after that. And it's still around uh, the city as we speak uh, in a program that's now supported by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and having that ability to detect pathogens, uh, why can't you detect SARS uh, and other kinds of, of viruses that uh, could generate pandemics? Uh, and here you have an example over five decades of something that spirals uh, into your core mission out into other areas, back in again, back out again, back in again, uh, and uh, advancing the technology as you go 
and enriching both the original purpose you started uh, as well as uh, future opportunities and challenges. The, the ability to address these and other problems of great importance and, uh, has, of course, unfortunately been more and more based on yesterday's investment and yesterday's infrastructure. Government investment in the physical sciences and engineering sciences as a percentage of the gross domestic product is barely above half what it was 30 years ago. Uh, there's been significant growth in the funding for the biological sciences at the same time. Path, uh, past investments can still lead to some great results that address today's needs, but we can't continually eat our seed corn uh, and indefinitely reap the, reap the benefit uh, solely on our past, benefit, uh, past investments. So what's the path forward? Well, I don't have the answers, um, although I have in my opinions, uh, but, it is, but it is time, I believe, as I said in the opening, to rebuild the partnership between government and the science and technology community. There are three elements, I think, to, to achieve that goal. Uh, where are we going? Uh, what structure should we have to enable action? And what's our investment strategy to get there? Uh, and so if I just briefly touch on each of these, uh, where are we going? We need a vision. Uh, and I think uh, our parents, uh, experience from the Cold War or uh, President Kennedy going to the moon, uh, a, a vision from the highest levels of government. And it's one that articulates the national importance, uh, understands the scope and the urgency of the security challenges. And this is, uh, are we going to go take on the issues about uh, our dependence on foreign oil? Or is it about terrorist nuclear weapon in Washington, D.C.? Or is it some uh, combination of all these things? At what level of challenge do we want to take this on? Uh, and we needed a vision to express us that. Because I believe whatever that vision might look like, uh, science and technology are going to be a key element to, to do that. It also needs to be a vision that inspires. Uh, and it needs to inspire all elements uh, of this partnership. The second one is, uh, what's the structure to enable action? And I think the structure uh, to execute uh, needs to be aligned with that vision so that it enables the execution through a sustained and trusting partnership and relationship between the government and the science and technology community. And, and although times are different, uh, recall that in the Cold War we had an Atomic Energy Commission and a Joint Committee on Atomic Energy in Congress. Uh, what are the appropriate structures today uh, to uh, enable execution toward a vision? And the third element is just like in the Cold War, as I alluded to, today and tomorrow's problems, I think, are going to be rooted, at least partially, the solutions uh, in science and technology. And so I think there needs to be a sustained investment in science and engineering research and development, including the human and phys uh, uh, physical infrastructure. And it's got to be an investment strategy that spans discovery science all the way to applied science. And uh, especially, I think, is important is the translational science I discussed that bridges uh, between the two. Uh, so there is that real connectivity and integration uh, focused on uh, the vision uh, that we need to have. And I believe that it's time that if the policy, the government, and the science and technology communities come together, reframe and rebuild this partnership in today's context, which is different than the Cold War, uh, we can and will meet the national security challenge not only of today, uh, but of the future. Um, with that, uh, I think those are my prepared remarks, and I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions there might be. Okay, let's open it up for questions from the floor. We'll have microphones on both sides. We'll begin right here. I'm Maria Stella. I just hold your hands up. We'll try to get to you. And I'll go where the glass of yes. water is. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, how can we uh, get to the general public and explain quantitative things for them and how important science and technology are? I think the, my experience is that the best way to get to a non-specialist audience is to tell stories. And I think we need some good examples of things that uh, 
the public cares about and that matters to them and show them how science and technology has had a, an important impact on doing those. And I think there are uh, just a plethora of those examples out there. And finding ones that are important uh, to today's public, I think, is a key to that. Rob, then I'll go over here. Just wanted to follow up on uh, your observation the role of the lab is to is a sort of the space in between discovery and application. And uh, if you could uh, discuss some of the activities at the lab into uh, energy independence and uh, getting leverage on uh, climate change. Sure. There is, uh, again, many examples of that. Uh, one is that the labs through their uh, core mission around nuclear weapons and stockpile stewardship uh, maintaining our confidence and safety and security and reliability without without nuclear testing and uh, computation high performance computation is a big uh, is a big element of that and it has been part of the laboratories almost since their inception at the same time uh, if you think about global climate uh, it's got some analogies you can't go do the experiment right um, it's a very complex nonlinear system we all know how hard it is to predict the weather uh, and so computing uh, and our uh, expertise and experience at using high-performance computing uh, to look at these kind of complex systems uh, is right up the alley of the laboratory. And so the laboratories are some of the leaders, uh, and at Los Alamos in particular, around ocean modeling, uh, which is a key element in thinking about the global climate, uh, is, uh, is key. On the other, on the other end, um, I would take something else, uh, working at the nanoscale, uh, we have some scientists at the laboratory who have seen that you can get carrier multiplication uh, in certain kinds of material. That means for one photon that comes into certain kinds of material, you can actually uh, get, you could get factors of two or more uh, amplification uh, in the amount of electrical energy. You can, you, so a more efficient conversion of light into electricity, a solar cell. Now this is just R&D research right now. Uh, it's not ready for R&D, much less uh, a product, but uh, here's fundamental discovery like science uh, that's uh, showing that there's uh, some possibilities that could, could, could bring to bear. And then a third, um, you know, one of the most interesting things about energy is, is uh, energy efficiency is we waste a lot of the energy uh, that we generate because we can't store it uh, or we inefficiently transport it. Uh, you know, through transmission lines and things. And one, one interesting idea is a superconducting uh, um, technology could lead to very more efficiency. And it turns out that we've discovered some new insights into superconductivity that might lead to um, room temperature-like superconducting uh, because of our research uh, into actinides and plutonium. Uh, so there is an interesting connection that you wouldn't think of. Okay. Uh, my name is Howard Moreland. Um, my, uh, I would propose that the only threat to American national security is nuclear war. And the only ultimate uh, way to eliminate that threat is global nuclear weapons elimination, which sounds Pollyanna, but it actually it's the basis of the Nonproliferation Treaty. The nuclear nations will disarm if the non-nuclear nations will forego nuclear arsenals. Um, what role are the labs willing to play in uh, promoting a global nuclear weapons abolition regime? Well, uh, let's see. The laboratory's role, of course, is not to set policy, but is to provide science and technology to enable policy decisions the government's made. Um, uh, interesting thing is, in, science, in fact, science, and I didn't speak to this in my talks, but uh, science and technology actually can uh, provide additional options that policymakers might not have thought of. Uh, and to answer, you know, to start to answer your question, if you remember uh, back to uh, the end of the Cold War, the, you know, we had a moratorium on nuclear testing starting in 1992, and there was great debate: uh, what should we do? Should we continue testing? Should we eliminate it? Should we have partial yield testing? And and the laboratories were able to come forward and. Um, postulate that they, uh, and the debate was about should we stop nuclear testing? Some believed you can't have nuclear weapons uh, if you don't test. Others believed uh, it's, it's really important for nonproliferation concerns not to test, and if that means I don't have confidence in nuclear weapons, so be it. 
uh, and where was the middle of ground that those two communities could agree and and I believe uh, bring forward a technical approach that uh, allowed us through more uh, detailed understanding, uh, scientific understanding of how uh, how they work, we are able to offer another option, which is stockpile stewardship and having having a moratorium on nuclear testing. You know, the country has brought down the number of nuclear weapons in this stockpile uh, quite dramatically over the last uh, decade and a half. Uh, I think we are moving forward, and I think the labs are participating uh, in that. Um, uh, but you know, we're not the ones that are going to make policy decisions. We're the ones that are going to provide the technology and science advice that enables the government to make those kinds of decisions. Question here, Maria Stella. Uh, you, uh, the uh, management of uh, LANL has changed in the last few years from being run by a university to being run by, um, correct me if I'm wrong, a, consort uh, a partnership between the university and, and the private companies. How do you view this as changing um, the way that uh, basic science is supported by the government, and do you see that there's any risk in um, allowing the profit motive to affect the kind of science you do at LANL? Well, I think uh, science is still, you know, I still believe uh, Los Alamos is a national security science laboratory, and it will be that. Uh, that's what we are today, and that's what's um, uh, important for us. Um, the new contractual relationship the laboratory and its m and o contractor has with the government as you say has changed um, it 's the first time I know of we've we 've done such a partnership between the university and and uh, private industry uh, to uh, to run such a contract. Uh, I would say it 's a work in progress uh, we 'll have to uh, to wait and see how 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 that works out. I can tell you as president of the uh, LLC that that runs that, that is that consortium. Uh, commitment is that it, it won't change at all uh, how, uh, how we run the laboratory and how we view uh, our role, but, uh, but again, it's back to this partnership with government. Um, we need to rebuild that partnership in today's context. Uh, what does it mean? Um, what kind of role does government see for, for, for an institution like us? Uh, and how do you manage it in a way to to uh, execute uh, you know a vision and a structure that the government the government wants to put in place and uh, I think we can still do that uh, i don 't see that uh, this relationship uh, will by uh, by itself um, impact our ability to do that there's a question there, and then the woman here in the blue uh, Maria Stella here fourth row there. I, I'd, I'd be interested in your comments on the funding decision for RRW and um, I'm what sorry on the, the what for our the funding decision for RRW oh, yeah. from Congress and what if any work will be able to be completed going forward and I uh, I'm also interested in um, perhaps your comments about where you see RRW fitting in terms of the national security concerns and, and challenges we face going forward that you referenced thank you sure RRW the re re reliable replacement warhead uh, program that was uh, 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 the appropriation committee and Cong appropriation in Congress uh, zeroed out funding for that this uh, for this year, uh, and so of course we will not work on that because uh, it's been zeroed out. Um, uh, where it will go in the future, I don't know. I think uh, I think this is a sign of the point I'm trying to make here today, uh, which is that we don't yet have a consensus vision on where we're trying to go and what we're trying to accomplish, and so. Uh, unfortunately, a decision by an appropriation committee is setting uh, is setting policy, um, and and it would be nice if we had this kind of coherent vision that that we all could get behind and go forward and execute. So I think to me it's a and I know there's a, a and I won't speak for Congress. I know there's a lot of concern about about what is the future look like, and we don't want to make this RRW decision until we know uh, something about the broader. A broader set of issues uh, is not an unreasonable concern. Um, so uh, I, I think I think this th this decision uh, about RRW kind of helps make the point I'm trying to make here today is we need to find that new consensus uh, that uh, that defines uh, what national security means uh, for the country in the context we're in today uh, and how to go forward and execute it.
Good morning. I'm Laura Holgate from the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Um, wanted to build on your comment about structures and um, think about what w the historical role of the Office of Technology Assessment has played in informing congressional views and, and legislation and policy building. And the, I, what I consider to be a very sad day in which that office was demolished. Um, wondering what your thoughts, and sir, if I could ask your thoughts from the congressional perspective as well, on what uh, some future structure might look like if you were to try to recreate or replace or do what needs to be done in, in current uh, politics to improve the, congr the technical and science understanding and background that goes along with the important role of legislating. Yeah, I guess I'm not an expert on Congress, or the, uh, or nor do I. Uh, even if I thought I were, do I want to express that here in this forum? Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, my point being is, I, I, you know, I have personal opinions and 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 and, and thoughts around many of these issues. But but my point today is, I think all the uh, elements. Uh, that uh, that are important to this partnership need to come together and and find answers to to these kinds of questions. Uh, so I, I don't have any specific comments on that specific issue you raised, except to say that there need to be in mechanisms that bring policymakers, uh, Congress, the executive branch, uh, the science and technology community together in ways that you can have this dialogue uh, come with come up with a. Uh, a mechanism. Right now, one of the challenges I think in Congress is uh, some of the issues that are important to national security are diffused in Congress over multiple committees, and, and that's and that makes it challenging um, to uh, to bring them together. Um, and so, what is the right way to do that? I, I'm not the expert to say how Congress uh, uh, should function, but I think there are, there are steps that we ought to think about uh, that could help enable. Uh, successful execution. Hi, I'm Jerry Epstein at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, at formerly at OTA, which was killed 12 years, 3 months, and 15 days ago, but not that <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and how many hours is that? <laughs> you talked about looking at the restoring the relationship between science and, and society and ability to serve security, pointing primarily to financial commitment and, and vision. I want to ask you to what extent you think there's a, a third set of issues there, whether they're major or minor, which is when you look at the regime, we have attempted to con control the application of science by our adversaries. We have had an export uh, control system which, not which the legislation not only has expired 10 years ago, but it was obsolete then. We have deemed export controls, we have sensitive and unclassified, we have visa mandus reviews that make it hard to bring talent into this country. Is this a serious problem? Is it a problem that, yeah, but we ought to deal with it, but not critical? Where do you put these? outdated, well, let me see, if, ask if you think they're outdated. Where do you put these concerns in? Well, I think they are concerns uh, that it's uh, uh, certainly technology and not n knowledge diffuse around the world in an, in an open society in, a, in, uh, in an inexorable, inexorable way. Uh, I think some of these restrictions uh, may be appropriate in some special circumstances, but, uh, but to the extent it impedes uh, the international exchange of knowledge, uh, which uh, which we as a country or and we as a laboratory uh, rely on, I think that's, uh, uh, that's potentially counterproductive. So uh, finding the right balance to protect, protect uh, technology. But my own personal view on that is that you can only protect these things for so long uh, that they will get out eventually. And so the real question is how do you stay ahead of the game? Uh, and I think, that's, uh, I think ultimately that will be always the key. The question here. Uh, uh, and then we'll go over here to this gentleman. Yeah, my question is about uh, transparency. Since we're dealing in science today with issues that can affect all of humanity, whether it's nuclear or nano or genetic change, uh, how do you see the, um, the, the right of the, of the human uh, everyday citizen to have uh, uh, information in terms of transparency, particularly in terms of privatization of science as well as government science? I'm not sure I understand what you're getting at exactly. I mean, I think uh, science. Uh, Should we require transparency in any issue that can affect all of humanity? Yeah, up to some point. I think there are uh, there are always issues of classified information, uh, the details. Let's say, do we do we want to share? Uh, all the details of how a nuclear weapon works and how you should go about developing yours, 
uh, and you might argue, I, I would argue that there are certain things that you ought to protect, but the general knowledge that you can and, and what it might mean if you do uh, certainly should be shared. And I think there are um, interesting challenges with, let's say, bio threats and uh, how do you deal with that same information that's much harder to, to control than, than it was in nuclear things back in the 40s. Um, and I think that that's a new challenge for us as, as, a, uh, as a world uh, to figure out what's the right way to uh, deal with that kind of information that can be very threatening uh, at the same time uh, uh, is uh, straightforward information that you can probably learn in college. So. Uh, I don't have an answer how to do that. I know there are people who are thinking uh, hard about those issues. And on some level, I think the science community needs to find a way to police itself, to be careful that certain things uh, maybe you just shouldn't uh, spread around uh, so much. Uh, and I know the science community back in the 40s and the 30s uh, did some of that around, around things nuclear. Uh, we have to think, find a way to do that around uh, these other kinds of threats. But then I think there's the others. You, uh, one worries me a lot is information security, uh, cybersecurity. Um, uh, the same technology that, that develops uh, and advances our ability to, to use uh, computational technology, you can just turn that exact same thing around and use it uh, to threaten you. And so how you control that, I think, is really, uh, really challenging. All right, sir. I'm Dick Benatta at the Science and Technology Policy Institute. Uh, Dr. Anastasio, you imply that something's broken or at least has sub substantially eroded. And is it, that, is it that so much or that things have just changed underneath our original policy premises for the national labs and the S&T capabilities that we want? Uh, I guess what you're s I'm getting is that you're saying, in essence, you're not getting the policy guidance and direction that you need to justify or focus the funding and the technology activities that you have and that you're looking for something other than what you're getting from the government. And I guess the question is, what mechanisms do you see? Is it just presidential initiatives? Is there some kind of commission, some kind of overarching mechanism or group? I just noticed that the technology investment program that's replacing ATP is supposed to focus on, on critical national challenges, critical national needs. No specification in Congress as to where or how those are supposed to be defined. Sounds to me like you have the same problem. Are we missing some kind of policy agenda, some kind of policy mechanism that would allow us to come to conclusions as to what this is, or are we just talking about basic political leadership? Well, I, I, you know, there's lots of studies out, and people do lots of studies all the time. Uh, I think what we need is not being a policy expert, but we need to come together around the policy issues uh, and mechanisms that are ap appropriate to today's context and the challenges, the security challenges the country faces and the, and the world faces. And, and I, I, I know personally that sometimes looking back to the Cold War that, that I got uh, involved in the middle of, uh, not in the beginning of, you, you think that it was a well-defined thing, uh, but it took, I believe, many years to develop the policies uh, that uh, turned out to be the Cold War. Uh, it's not a surprise that it takes time to uh, rethink uh, what uh, what are the security challenges and what are the policies and approaches we take uh, today? And my point is, I think it's uh, it's time that we all get energized to really focus on that, uh, so that we can uh, uh, move this forward as quickly as we can, because the threats are out there and real, and they worry me a lot. Um, and I think if we have the kind of vision uh, that uh, that that brings us together, uh, all the elements of that community, and can. Uh, can be articulated to, articulated to the country, uh, then we have the best option, a uh, best opportunity to move forward, and a lot of the other problems we feel uh, will become uh, uh, will kind of resolve themselves. Uh, okay, all the way in the back. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I wanted to follow up both on this question and also some of the other questions that have been asked, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more specifically when you talk about reinvigorating this government science relationship. Who are the kinds of bodies that you're thinking about and in what, what are the processes that you're thinking about? And, and the second related question to that is if you think about it, you know, sort of top down, bottom up, coming from the government, coming from the scientific community, you mentioned that there are issues around um, 
you know, getting the best people in science, and I'm wondering if you have, you know, then if the, the dictates come from the top down, then there might be increased problems in getting scientists into national laboratories because the edicts are coming from the top as opposed to from a, you know, sort of what the labs themselves are, are coming up with. Um, let's see, so a lot of questions in there, I think. Um, I, I really think there needs to be a coming together and a partnership, so it's not kind of top down or bottoms up or crosswise. I think all the, uh, the smart thinkers at places like the Wilson Center uh, need to be thinking about what, what, you know, what does it mean to meet our national security challenges of today? What, what's it take to do that? And I think we have a new administration coming uh, in a year or so. Uh, uh, it'd be nice to, uh, to help influence that administration, whether in a new Congress, as, as, uh, here's a direction the country ought to be heading, and can we uh, get them on board, and can they inspire all of us to, uh, to go execute? Um, and at the same time, uh, top down, uh, will that restrict the laboratory? I think it's important if we have uh, a consensus on what we're trying to accomplish, I think it's important to have some flexibility and freedom and discretion at the laboratory to, uh, to figure out best how to, how to achieve that. And, and that was one of the relationships in the Cold War, the uh, science, big science and its application for uh, national issues were relatively new at the time. Uh, and there was a, uh, a confidence in the science community that we can uh, give you the challenge and let you figure out how to meet it. Um, and uh, if we can uh, get back to something like that relationship again, where we uh, have that trusting, trusting relationship, I think that that will be very effective and uh, make our uh, make our effectiveness at the laboratory a, a, a lot higher. Uh, we'll take two more questions here and then over here. Mm -hmm. Uh, David Kopp with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Several. Uh, oh, there you are. Okay, thank you. <laughs> several of the um, major presidential candidates have called for the ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and one of them specifically called for it to come back to the Senate next year. Would you support ratification of the CTPT? You know, uh, uh, my job is to to advise policymakers on science and technology issues. Uh, not to make declarations about policy. Uh, and so if the country uh, chooses to, um, to, uh, to ratify a comprehensive test brand, uh, I can uh, comment on what I think the, the consequences will be or what the technical challenges will be. Um, so I'm not here to support or not support such a thing. Okay, final question here. I'm uh, Roy Peterson. I'm a Jefferson Science Fellow bridging the academic world with the State Department. Hmm. I'm a physicist, so I'll ask this as a question on impedance matching. <laughs> How might offices such as mine ask the questions we worry about to explore, first informally, the lab's interests and abilities to answer those questions, and then on the other side, how to make sure that the answers indeed couple to the problems that we are trying to fix? You say, how do we do that? Yes. Uh, with What's the, what can you suggest some effective mechanisms for impedance matching that we haven't tried before? Oh, um, um, geez, I don't know that we haven't tried before. I think there are uh, uh, mechanisms like the, the one we're doing today where you uh, bring to a center like this uh, people from a broad spectrum of backgrounds and so on them and have them uh, sit and talk and, and having forums and workshops and a whole variety of ways to uh, bring together a uh, uh, diversity of ideas uh, from a diversity of people with diversity of backgrounds, uh, and that's how uh, how you can bring, I think, how you can bring uh, good things forward. Uh, it's conversation between uh, the between people who are uh, who are committed to uh, to the same overarching issue that can help us. Uh, but it w as far as new mechanisms, I I'm not sure that I have any in mind. I think we'll probably have to conclude because of Dr. Anastasio's schedule, but uh, <coughs> it's been kind of interesting to me, to Mike, to hear the number of times the word mechanism has come up in this uh, conversation ah. <laughs> relating to the um, uh, need to strengthen and improve the dialogue between the scientific community and the <coughs> policy community. 
Uh, we want to try to help on that to the extent that we can, and we're very grateful to you for your willingness to come here and to respond to these questions. We hope that we can have you come back again in the future, and we look forward to our continuing collaboration uh, with you on these matters.